Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is now the 30th edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through some introductory slides and then we're going to get straight into it. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who's joining us for the first time. And I know a good few of our regulars are on here. So welcome back to all of those. Uh, for anybody who's joining us for the first time, the structure of the webinar is we've got two companies presenting over the hour. Each company presents in a 30 minute slot, which we kind of break down into a 20 minute prezzo and then 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. If you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. Uh, it just makes it easier to moderate the questions for our presenters at the end. And um, the webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel um, first thing tomorrow morning. So if one of our presenters does skip over a slide uh, a little bit quick or you, you miss something, uh, you can watch it back. Indeed, you can also watch back any of the previous 29 versions of this series. Uh, you can follow Coffee Microcaps uh, Twitter, uh, YouTube, as I said, for the recording of this webinar and all previous ones, LinkedIn. I also write a weekly paid uh, newsletter where I profile one interesting microcap stock a week, and you can get that on the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, our first presenter who we're going to get to in, in a minute is Mr. Sam Riley, the CEO of Ansarada Group. And then I'm delighted to say we'll be welcoming back Steve Boland, the MD of Acro Farmwork and Construction Services, who will be our second presenter. So that's enough from me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Sam, who I know is waiting in the wings. Sam, if you want to start sharing your screen. Sure, you got that coming up, Mark. Yeah, uh, just yeah, put it into present. Yeah. Uh, I can see your screen now when you're in presentation mode. Thanks, Sam. Okay, thanks, Mark. And look, uh, great to meet everyone virtually on here. Excited to talk you through a bit about Ansarada, uh, past, present and future. So the agenda I want for today to take you guys through is a bit about us. Zoom in on some of the customer stories to bring to life what we do in, a, in some in real scenarios and uh, take a peek at our Q3 results and walk you guys through through them and what's driving things for us. And um, I'll wrap up with a bit of an investment case and of course the Q&A. So about Ansarada, you might wonder what the name means. It actually is an anagram of the four founders. There's Andrew, Sam, who you're speaking to, Rachel and Daphne. And we got together 15 years ago uh, to build a platform to help people conduct due diligence, share information in particularly in mergers and acquisitions. But over 15 years, we've expanded a lot. Uh, one of the expands, apologies for the grainy image, but this is an image of um, us listing on the ASX late last year. And the third person, in from the left there next to me, I'm in, in the middle with the red tie, is Stuart Clout. And Stuart's a founder of the Dockyard and the Dockyard has an excellent workflow project management capability that gets used in M&A deals and other things as well. And we merge together. So I'll tell you that story because we've actually got like nearly five founders in, in the business that are active. So. That's a key part of uh, what drives our culture and results and that level of ownership from the founders. And since listing, we, we still have more than a 20% stake and ownership in the business. And we have long-term incentives as well on performance are highly aligned to shareholders as well. Thought I'd share that with you. Now what Ansarada is, is we are an information governance platform that people use to be confident in making decisions and managing critical outcomes. So why, why is information governance critical? Well, it's a big problem in the world because you know, if I asked everyone on this call, who thinks information is gonna grow in size and complexity for businesses over the coming years? I'm sure you would all say, yes, information will grow. Who thinks regulation and compliance uh, requirements and transparency will grow? Yes, it will grow the speed of decision making in business becomes a very big advantage uh, executing strategy and collaborating with people that 
that's important to get right in your business as well. So it's a very binary question for businesses. You either govern your information really well, especially in your most critical outcome moments, and you can actually gain an advantage. You can execute strategy faster. You can reduce risk. You can get better information to make decisions. Or you neglect that and you actually end up with the opposite. So that's what we help people do. And I'll talk you through the context of how we do it. But that, that space we operate in is called governance, risk and compliance. And the software market for that and the transactional market for deals like if you think about a capital raising or a company going refinancing a, de a debt facility, uh, doing a merger and acquisition, uh, even post merger integration, that's a $1.4 billion market. But the total market we're addressing, it is a $20 billion market. And we, 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 you'll see we're established overseas in several places. So it's a big, big problem. It's gonna grow. It's, and it's a very large international problem with an established um, uh, market there for GRC. So how we tackle that, we, we're not into governing any information. Like we don't, we don't do general document storage. We really help people achieve outcomes on uh, deals when they're doing M&A, cap raising, stuff like that. Board, we have a board product, a board portal for board management. So if you think about board meetings, board papers, all the governance activities at the board, how the company secretary operates the, and all the directors. We've got a product that helps govern information there, very critical. We've got a product for compliance. So if you think about ISO standards, like that people have to get audited against and be compliant. And you also think about regulation, like privacy regulation or security, or depending what industry you operate in, you could have AFS compliance with the finance industry. And the, the last product we have is we, we, we got an opportunity eight years ago to do the franchising of the Melbourne train and tram network. And that was a $20 billion project that ran on our platform to, to facilitate the information flow and governance for the tender. And since that time, we've really chipped away at building a capability for tendering and building infrastructure. So Answer Artist platform gets used for big projects like the $8 billion inland rail project, um, building hospitals, uh, the Sydney light rail, West Connects toll roads. Uh, we, we do infrastructure work in America with public toll roads and things like that. And we also just got awarded by the UAE to run the Etihad um, rail project, which is another multi-billion dollar project. So our tenders products, again, governing information there. So all of those deals and products, they require a lot of collaboration. So the customers we serve are quite broad because to get a, to make critical decisions and get a great outcome, it's very collaborative from the C-suite, their accountants, the lawyers, investment bankers, and obviously the board. So one of the advantages of having all of this on one platform is those people can collaborate and get their work done faster and easier. Uh, we, we did get started in 2006, was our first year of revenue. And like I said, we're established overseas now quite a lot. And ne nearly half of our revenue comes from outside of ANZ. Uh, our European business is the fastest growing uh, segment we have. The other thing we have as a great asset is 15 years of data. We've done over 24,000 transactions and we've been able to turn that data into AI tools that automate work for people and also give them insights to make smart decisions. Like we can tell people, if you're gonna sell an asset and have a bidder come in and look at it, our AI will benchmark their behavioral patterns to the patterns of people that actually do bid on assets and win and buy them. And we'll tell you how engaged they are and, and who, who isn't engaged. And, and that's drawing from thousands of deals of data. So there's a lot of innovation that data powers for us. So it's a portfolio of solutions that we sell. You can think about a CFO that works across all of these. There's a common buyer for us or, or an accounting firm or a legal firm or an investment bank 
and or, or the go a government department or a consultant that runs tenders. These people, thousands of them use Ansarata every day. So a bit about our product. It's really, if you want to govern information, the circle in the middle takes you through the life cycle of that. Uh, you've got to be able to create it and edit it. You share and collaborate on it and comment. You want to be able to control and protect it. Big strengths of Ansaratas is that. We can allow people to temporarily save documents, even on their desktop, and then we can tell who's opening it, who's not, and we can also revoke access to that remotely. So even though they've saved it, when they go to open it again, it can be removed. So it's a complete control and complete audit trail. So from who created it, who shared it, who opened it, who asked questions on it, who gave answers, you got the full chain of custody for people. It reduces a lot of risk, gives people confidence to move fast. We let people store documents in multiple jurisdictions. Like if you use Ansarata, you can choose to store your documents in Switzerland or America or Singapore. This is very critical when you're doing you know, work where the jurisdiction of where the information is held is important. And also you can revoke access and destroy things, like I said. So all of those, with there's thousands of features we have that power that and people use it to start a deal and run a deal, run their board, uh, Stockland and Mervac and lots of the big real estate companies, they use Ansarata because they're financing properties, they're buying properties, they're selling properties, they've got a lot of compliance. These are all users of Ansarata as well. And also the private equity firms, as you can imagine, lots of deal activity, private equity, venture capital, their Ansarata customers also. One of the things I'm excited about is something we just launched last week. <laughs> and this is answer out of workflow. So if you think about the project management aspects of doing something complex with uh, you know, thousands of documents and hundreds of people with specific expertise, you really need to ha have like a good view of who's doing what, when and how. And you want to standardize that because a lot of the junior people do a lot of the work but they don't have the experience and they don't want to make a mistake so you can what's happening now in the world of, of corporate deal making and, and large projects is a lot of the knowledge is getting operationalized in in templates and, and lists that give people the guardrails to follow so it accelerates things so you know if you there's a bit of a screenshot of what i'm talking about you can see there's something to be done by someone at a certain time and there's a status but it's a lot more sophisticated than that. And, and you can um, codify your knowledge and operations in, in, the, in our system. And it's another addition that's a big advantage for us. How's Ansarata gonna grow? Well, our deals platform and standardizing it, it is, it is growing a lot. And we're gonna continue to grow our deals platform with all the world's top advisors that are already customers. Uh, we're growing it with companies, we're growing it with governments. We also have customers that are finding us, uh, it could be through the board product, and then they're using us for a deal, or they find us for a capital raise, and then they use Ansarata's board product. So we're expanding customers across multiple products in the suite as we diagnose the needs that they have around compliance or board, or are you know, they going to raise capital? Are they going to list on the ASX? We, we power a lot of IPOs as well. We're growing a lot internationally. And one of the ways we're doing it is that fourth box there on the e-commerce channel. And, and I'll show you how exciting that is for us because our industry being B2B software, typically you wouldn't see people buy things online and, and deploy them, but that's rapidly changing. And, and we're a leader in that and driving it. Um, none of our competitors have it. I won't read you this whole quote. This is a great example. Craig Adams, he's a CEO of a fast growth Australian company, and they're doing lots of activity. He came to Ansarada to get ready for and execute a capital raise. So then he found out what he can do with compliance for privacy standards like GDPR and that. And he expanded into using our platform to manage that. And then Craig and the board there at Canopy Tools they also now adopted Ansarata board. So multiple products, 
an expansion story and the reasons why Craig says strategies executed quicker, better collaboration with his team and their advisors and much more visibility and control, which is fundamental for governance. We're a market leader in deals in South Africa. We expanded there a few years ago. One of our clients there is PSG Capital. Now they, they famously did the $2 billion PepsiCo deal there, South African deal of the year. PSG Capital is part of PSG Group. So PSG Capital trust us a lot and you know they love the simplicity of our product and the speed. And we introduced them to our board product for their, their group company. And they've now adopted Ansarada board. The reasons why, leveraging off the brand and trust and credibility, but also they want simplicity at the board. They want to improve risk management. So they expanded there. Very excited to share what we did in Q3. This is up on the ASX if you want to go for a presentation we did there. Our Q3 wins up 29% year on year. Okay. Customers okay. got up to a record level of 3,200, 18% year on year growth, 6% Q on Q quarter on quarter. Uh, same with subscribers, they're actually, our business is made up of people that pay us un under what we call a legacy model, which, which we've been transitioning for the last two years to subscription-based revenue. So the subscription, the subscribers actually grew uh, faster there, as you'll see, 26%. Got our revenue up to 9 million for the quarter, which was some great growth. The ARPA means the average revenue per account for us that was stable at 1,032 per month. So that was great to see. And also we're operationally cash flow positive, which was another, another great thing uh, for us in the quarter. So you'll see here a run rate of Ansarada over the years. Like I said, we started in 2006, we only put in $30,000. We didn't raise uh, really much capital at all until we decided to go after the governance, risk and compliance market big time. And we raised capital in, in 2018. You'll notice here the effect of COVID on us was 2019 to June 20, where we, we still grew. But last year in Q4, around this time, it was obviously a very uncertain time for the world and the markets and uncertainty affected our business as well. But since that time, we've rapidly recovered and we're now increasing our rate of growth. I told you I was excited about our e-commerce channel. Here is why. We launched it last year in February. So it's about a year old and we've been refining and building it and channeling people there ever since. And it continues to grow quarter on quarter. In, and in Q3, it actually contributed 26% of our total increase in customers. So that, that was great. So it's a very uh, efficient channel. It's got a lot of operating leverage for us. It's highly scalable and we're able to point it anywhere in the world, obviously being e-com. Um, so we're excited about that and it's a big growth factor. So if I wrap things up for you guys, I think the top five reasons why you'd want to look at Ansarada is it's a $20 billion information governance market out there with risk and compliance it's only going to grow and we've got a compelling set of solutions there an established brand and revenues internationally COVID was actually good for us because it actually accelerated the need for companies to govern their information better because people had to make a lot of decisions they had to raise capital sell something get some debt they had to get their board and advisors intimately involved and guess what? You need to do that properly. Information governed in the right way. So that, that helped us. Uh, strong financial position. We have no debt. We got 22 million in the bank and we run the business on growth, but we don't want to burn cash either. Uh, with established brand overseas and it's a very buoyant um, equity debt and capital markets. So the deal making activity, if you go and look out in the world at the commentary that experts are giving, they're predicting you know, the highest rate of activity ever for deals. And also Ansarada has got a history of delivering innovations to the market. I showed you the workflow release, but we're not finished. We've got some exciting stuff that is gonna really add even more value to our customers, help them move faster and, and um, make better decisions and reduce risk. So with that said, I'll, I'll pause there and jump into some uh, Q and A. 
Thanks, Samuel. We've got uh, actually one or two that was emailed into me ahead of time, and we've got uh, some that have come in live, but I'll just start with one of the emailed ones first, if I can. Um, Intralink, so I'm sure, you know, I think they're a competitor to you guys. Do you yeah. compete with them particularly uh, on price, or do you compete with them around functionality? You know, what's your, I guess, unique selling point versus a, a competitor like Intralinks? Yeah, it would depend who we're selling to, but if it's a, if it's an investment bank that really just uses Enstrata for deal making, uh, we would with our deals product we would compete on people tell us over and over simple. So our product you can get jobs done in less clicks. It's faster. It's easier to use. They're the key things. And when it gets to functionality, we have a we have our own proprietary tools around artificial intelligence and machine learning that give people uh, reports and insights that you can't get. Um, so that that's a big thing that people say. Now, if we're talking and we do our core customers, companies, if we're talking to a CFO, that's a different story because with the CFO, they will do deals, but they also, they're looking at a board solution. They have compliance activity. Intralinks don't offer those things. So we say, look, you can do anything Intralinks does, but you get a lot more with Ansarada. So the total cost of ownership is lower and it's a better experience, like I just said, the simplicity of it. Okay. Um, and then maybe this is a question, maybe a broad one on the revenue model. The I know you're moving to um, recurring subscriptions. Are they on a monthly basis or an annual basis or what what's what does that look like yeah it's a mix we offer uh customers uh, multiple subscription terms so we have a monthly subscription um some people want a three-month subscription like that's more of a transactional use uh, but we also have annual subscriptions so in in any given month around 50 percent of our customers go on monthly subscription and 50 percent choose uh, annual. Now, obviously, that corporate story I was telling you, which is our core customer and everything we're targeting, the CFO story, they're choosing more of an annual um, agreement uh, because they're using multi products on the platform. Okay. And then another one that was emailed in ahead of time, if I can. Um, key channels to market um, overseas. Uh, do you have a direct uh, sales team on yes, the ground? Sir. No, so or, sorry, I think you can't hear it. You can't hear that. Or is it a, not sure what happened there, or do you work through partners in, in the international markets? Yeah, we've got uh, three, three channels that reach overseas. So, yes, we do have a, a sales team on the ground. Uh, we have an office in Sydney. We also have a um, team in Amsterdam. We have a team in Chicago. We've got a team in London. We've got a team in Johannesburg, so they're on the ground um, and obviously doing all the activities that you'd expect sales to do. We also have an excellent customer success team. Actually, that's another feedback versus Intralinks. Uh, customers tell us your, your customer success team are just rock stars. They're so good. And these guys have done like thousands of deals. So they actually help people set themselves up for success in our product. They're not, they're not service support people. They're, customer success so yes we have those channels the e-commerce channel as i told you that's a rapidly growing one that we're getting using overseas but also the advisors that are customers of ours are a tremendous channel as well so you can imagine goldman sachs who use Ansarata in various places around the globe they will come to us and and say hey we've got a we've got a client that needs to uh you know, raise capital or they're going to sell their business or they're going to do some deal, um, you know, we'd, we'd like you guys to, to run that. So those advisory firms like, you know, the KPMGs of the world, you know, got large law firms around the world, they, they channel constantly new customers to us for a deal. And then we, we build relationships with those corporates and we expand into um, other products with them. So it's it's a it's a great channel that advisory one overseas. Okay, and then uh, I don't know if you have this number off the top of your head, but um, 
Yeah, rough idea of you know what proportion of subscribers are using Ansarad uh, just for deal making, um, versus you know somebody like I guess like PSG Group who you know using yeah. deal making as and when needed, but you know have now expanded to using the board. I'm guess um the board module on an ongoing basis. Like how many customers I I guess are using more than one of the 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 modules. Yeah, so I'll tell you what it was about th uh, two or three years ago. It was uh, zero, <laughs> you know, because answer right, uh, we cut our teeth in deals, and it's it's been good actually because it's uh, there's no greater place and time in a corporate life where you need to govern your information really really well. So having a capability there has allowed us to expand into those other products. Yeah, but three years ago it was um, you know nearly hundred percent deals and maybe a little bit of um, tenders and infrastructure work um but now it's around 80 percent so you know 20 percent of uh, our customers are doing multiple things repeat things with us uh that have nothing to do with deals and also our tender business is um you know part of that 20 percent as well so you know if you ask me that question in a year you know i would hope to say you know there's less people that just use this for deals because our strategy is to keep expanding that and expanding it out. Okay, great. And then what are you doing in the e-commerce channel that, that that is growing so quickly? Is that, you know, relying on digital marketing overseas to kind of get it in front of, in front of people or is it, you know, a function of, COVID, you know, your direct sales team can't yeah. meet face to face with, I guess, decision makers. You know, what, what is what's really driving that e-commerce adoption of um, a sales channel? Yeah. yeah, well, one, the experience we've made is really quick and easy. It's not just like adding something to a shopping cart and buying it. We, you know, we they want a specific configuration of our product, but we spin that up and they get in there and they can get things done straight away. So it can be up and running in minutes or seconds. So th that experience is great. But how we drive demand for it is, um, first of all, targeting the right personas. And I took you through our customers' personas and we do a lot of targeting. And then we create awareness and we've got a, a variety of content. I encourage you to go on answerata.com and look at our success stories or answerata.com slash TV. And you'll see some of the customer films we've produced and things. So we've got a variety of content that we put out on all the social media channels. We, we run a, a whole range of stuff in direct, um, direct mail as well, ads, publications in, in financial publications and things like that so if you follow Ansarada, you'll see this stuff around there that creates demand we've got a lot of educational content so here's a guide to raising capital here's a here's a guide to doing x y and z we, and that gets people into our e-commerce funnel because we have it we offer a 14 day free trial which is is uh, really well received people can get in they don't have to put in a credit card we've removed all the friction um, and for advisors now, we actually offer them the ability if they want to use Ansarada on a deal, they can get it up and running and their fees don't commence until the deal goes live. So that lets people get started early, very quickly, no risk. And the other thing I'd say is ansarada has got over 400,000 users in our product and we constantly are marketing to them. So we've got a pretty large subscriber base to things like our newsletter and our social channels. So we'll, we'll put um, the e-commerce channel offerings in front of those people. And, and the other thing that drives it um, as well is word of mouth. Um, we're seeing that recently start to have an effect now that it's growing. Okay. Sam, we, we, we didn't manage to get to all, all the questions, but um, for those, I, I apologize if we didn't get to your specific question, but I mean, they can email uh, investors at answerada.com uh, if, they, if they so choose. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. I know our next presenter is waiting in the wings. So Sam, if you could please yeah, just stop sharing your screen. And then we're going to head and hand over to Steve. Uh, Steve, if you want to start sharing your screen. Uh, 
coming up now and just go into slide share mode. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. You're ready. It's all fine, Mark. It's on. Yeah, looks great. My side, Steve. So you're ready to go. Okay, terrific. Okay. Thanks very much, Mark. And, and uh, thanks, folks, for joining us today. Um, some of you will obviously be hearing about ACRO for the first time, and, and some may be uh, a little bit more familiar with our story. So um, I'll look forward to giving you as much information as I can in the short period of time that we've got this morning. So if you just bear with me one second while we get the technology working properly. One second. Sorry, I just got a frozen screen for the moment. You need to go to the next page. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, folks. My screen. No, there we go. Fine. We are working. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so just just an overall snapshot of our business. Um, some of the the, the key things um, of 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 Acro. Um, you can see. Um, that we have a national footprint with we operate in every state in Australia and we have 10 depots. I'll give more detail about that in a second. Um, 1,300 customers, 245 employees. Um, our, our revenue is now up to over $100 million. So we'll, we'll do $106, $107 million circa revenue in this current financial year. Um, we have about $130 million of replacement value in our equipment that we hire. Um, this business has been around for a long time. It was incorporated in 1950. Um, previously, it was part of Boral. Um, uh, it was sold by Boral into private equity in about uh, 2011. And then it was taken public in April 2018. And, you know, we obviously operating in the construction industry as we do. Um, it's important that we have a uh, very strong focus on safety. And we've had very good re um, record in safety over a period of time. So um, just give a bit of a picture of, of, of how, what we do and where we operate. So we are a provider of um, engineered solutions for um, form work scaffold and industrial scaffold. We've, we've, we've primarily become um, a more form work orientated business, which is basically providing equipment that sits into the supporting of the laying of um, a concrete and forming of concrete and on very large projects. And I'll show some, some of the projects later that we work on. Um, in our industry and across the markets that we operate, it's fair to say that there is no other business in Australia that operates across the geographies that ACRO does and provides the range of services that ACRO does. So um, you can see we're in all of the major capital cities. We also operate um, a smaller depot in Launceston to complement what we do in Hobart. So there's, no, there's none of our competitors that actually operate across all of those geographies with the range of services that we do. So that gives us you know, a large, um, sort of, I, I think, operational benefit. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not a believer in the fact that there's one Australian construction market. I believe there are a series of different markets that all operate in each of the different different geographies. Um, and when, you know, when there's opportunities, say in the West, we have we can move gear into the West when there's opportunities more on the East Coast as there is, you know, large opportunities in civil infrastructure at the moment. We can move gear on the East Coast and take advantage of it. So we can move within markets and we move within geographies um, fairly rapidly. The strategy of this business over the last period of time, um, we'll, we used to say number one was we wanted to become the leading engineered formwork sales and hire equipment solutions provider in Australia. We are now that clearly the leader in this particular market. Um, we have um, we, we now have a very strong goal to become a leading engineered scaffold solutions provider to the Australian industrial scaffold market. Um, very, very different markets in industrial scaffold operating in sort of oil and gas and power stations, et cetera, than operating in commercial residential scaffold. Um, and you, you, the major differences between certainly the formwork markets and the industrial scaffold markets versus the old fashioned scaffold sitting around the high rise development is you're far more important to the construction the, than, than you know, just providing a safe access for around the site as you do with scaffold. Um, it's very much um, not a price-driven commoditized market. You know, we're now, I'd, I'd suggest we're at the, very much at the cutting edge of some of the biggest projects in Australia where um, reputation and engineering smarts, et cetera, are far more important than price. 
Um, that's certainly coming through in the results that this business is now generating. That takes me to the next point around recruiting and, and retaining the, the best management and engineering talent. This is an engineering driven business today. It wasn't the case. I've been with the business now about seven, well, actually now nearly eight years um, as part of the turnaround process in private equity now into public company land. Um, we have really pushed hard to make a differentiation, the, the ability we have in engineering smarts to come up with the right solutions for customers. So this is now a solutions driven, customer driven engineering focused business. Um, we've made, we've, the next point around organic growth, we've made two acquisitions since we've become a public company. One was a business net form that we acquired um, about two and a half years ago that provides screens on um, high rise commercial developments and other types of projects. Uh, and that business was focused in New South Wales. We're now taking those products nationally. And then we bought a business called Unispan 18 months ago, which has taken us to the next level in terms of um, equipment as they had a, uh, they have, and we now enjoy a relationship with a, a Spanish manufacturer of former equipment that puts us at the cutting edge of developments in, in this industry. Now, there's a lot of development going on. Um, and again, that was a business that was only focused really in Queensland, small business in New South Wales. We're now opening up a range of significant um, new opportunities and new channels for revenue across the rest of the country. So become a, a large part of what we do. And the large part of our growth is now just on organic growth from you know, promoting our, our, our wide range of products across all of our geographies. I've mentioned we've made two acquisitions. We are in a, a, you know, an acquisitive business in the right circumstances. We don't have anything specific on our plate today, um, but we are always looking for things that will add value. And I'd say in the next sort of 12 to 24 months, in the industrial scaffold market, probably some a business based in the west of Australia or in South Australia, um, you, you may see an acquisition come up from Acro at some point in the next period of time, probably next two years. Um, this is a really important as to what we what what happened to Acro since we became a public company. So if you look at that top chart, um, you can see that in in seventeen and eighteen we were getting the majority of our earnings were coming out of commercial residential scaffold. Again, as I mentioned, a highly commoditized price-driven business, a price-driven market. That's now moved almost completely the other direction now. You can see now we get, as of the first half of 21, we only had 20% of our earnings kind of out of commercial residential scaffold. In the second half of 21, you'll see that number down to probably less than 15%. Um, we are now very much focused on formwork and industrial scaffold to generate our profit. Um, it's far more sustainable um, we're in a very, very strong cycle in both of those parts of the parts of our industry that the cycle that will go for probably the next decade. So we're in, we're in great shape now in terms of where we get our earnings from. It's far more, more far more sustainable, and and you know in the parts of the parts of the industry where you know price isn't the major driver for um, work being awarded. The bottom chart shows the other thing that's developed in our business is now sale of product as well as the hire of product. So you can see over time how much revenue we're now generating from selling our products, um, as well as hiring our products. Now that, those things work complementary. A lot of cases, form workers like to buy equipment uh, rather than hire. Um, once you get them using your system, you've got great opportunity then to do further sales and also further cross hire opportunities. So become a large part of what we do and a successful part of what we do. Um, you probably all, a lot of you would have seen these sorts of information before and, and we roll it out sort of every six months when we're giving market updates. But look, it's really become very, very relevant to us right at the current period of time because I'm now seeing significant growth off the back of this civil infrastructure opportunity. So um, if you look, look at what's happened between sort of 18 and 21, there's been a small amount of growth, but not enormous growth. And it's fair to say the dynamic in this part of the industry is that you don't, norm, you don't get the big peaks that are necessarily being forecast. They tend, the projects tend to go in a more in flatter, but for longer. Um, that being said, you can see between 21 and 23, there's now very large growth, some, some, somewhere near 70% of, of growth in spend in, in infrastructure projects in the country. Um, I don't expect it to be 70%. It might be more like 20 or 30%, but it certainly is a significant growth. and, and, and I'm quite happy if it's a flatter and longer period, um, but certainly over the next decade, um, we will see increased spending in civil infrastructure and we're extremely well positioned to take, take advantage of that. Um, the next chart shows what's actually happened in ACRO over this period, um, where what's, what's happened to the transport infrastructure spend and what's happened to our revenue earning out of that particular part of the market. So 
in that very middle graph, you can see that um, the numbers between 18 and 21, there's actually only been 16% growth in civil infrastructure spend in the country over that period. Um, and then it's forecast to go up by some 75% over the next couple of years. Now, again, I don't believe it'll be 75%, but it certainly won't be, won't be 16. The important number for me in that bottom right-hand corner, which is our revenue that comes out of the civil infrastructure sector, our revenue over a period where the, the, the market has only gone up 16% in total spend, our revenue from that sector has gone up 61% over the same period. So if you look at our first half 21 and second half 21 combined revenues out of this sector uh, versus what it was in first half 18 and second half 18, it's, uh, it's $48 million versus $29 million. So we're, we've had significant growth in that area now. Um, and, and you can see where it's coming from. We had no business in Victoria to, to, to really talk of um, three years ago. We've now got good, very good, strong revenues, some $14 million a year coming out of the Victorian civil infrastructure market. New South Wales, after a slow start, is starting to pick up. The real story for us, though, is our, our heartland for our, we've, we've got probably 60% market share is in Queensland. And you can see in Queensland that our revenue sort of tailed off and is now significantly increasing. Um, because if I go back, I go back a page, if you see those projects that are kicking in in the 21 to 23 period, a lot of these are very big Queensland projects. The Crimson couple up there, Bruce Highway, Cross River Rail, the Inland Rail, they're all predominantly Queensland based projects. And, and we're already seeing significant revenue starting to be generated from these projects. Um, we are a project based business. We normally don't have long term contracts. We basically, we, do, we work with the same customers over time, but we do go sort of project to project. So winning work on a consistent basis is incredibly important for us. You can see that, the, the, that over the period, um, first half 20 to first half 21, we had 31% growth in the, in, in the volume of them. So this is the value of the contracts that we win in a particular month. So you know, over, over the first half 21, we won $17.5 million worth of higher revenue contracts that then will go into probably the you know, six months after that. So this is a very strong lead indicator to future performance. I've seen this over the eight years I've been with ACRO, how important this is to keep this number up. The really important statistic here though, is that um, in, the, in the March month particularly, and in, the, in that March quarter, we've had our best ever results. So we're up 50% for the quarter of March, the first quarter of this, of this calendar year, March 21. Um, and the month of March was up 92% on last year. And then the, the extension from this is that in the last six months, so since November last year, the three best months ACRAV has ever had in terms of winning new contracts have all happened in the last six months. November, February, and March. Uh, so November 20, February 21, March 21 are, are individually the best ever months we've had in terms of winning new contracts. And I can see that now in, in terms of the uplift in higher revenue that is being forecast to kick in basically from May um, right through until at least the end of the new this, this calendar year. So um, gives us a great degree of confidence around what our results are going to look like going forward. Um, just to give you a bit of a picture of, of the type of work we do, because it's probably a little bit misunderstood some, sometimes. I mean, this is smart work. This is, this is clever engineered solutions for highly technical projects. You know, all of the equipment you're seeing there is formwork equipment that is specifically designed for a, a, a type of um, concrete, concrete forming exercise um, on some of the biggest projects in the country. The CYP, which is the Melbourne Metro Rail, which is the first picture and the third picture. The middle one, which is probably the best project that we've ever undertaken in my time. Um, you can see all that, what looks like scaffolding equipment on the sides of that. Um, that's actually uh, a, a, an acro specific product called Super Cup Lock that actually is holding up the laying of the concrete. And then our, our traveling platform is which the orange, the orange bit of equipment in the middle it goes along with the laying of the laying of the concrete. Now this, this is a zinc uh, refinery in just, just, just in, uh, sorry, south of Townsville. Um, and that was the electrolysis plant being built. And that, that gear sat in place for around about six to seven months highly um, profitable for us and very good for the builder. We got great reports from the builder about how, uh, how successful this was in, in saving labor and crane time for the builder. Uh, mentioned we're on the biggest projects in the country at the moment, the Sydney Metro Rail. We've just got a lot of gear going out at the moment to the Crow's Nest Station. That'll generate about $1.3 million in high revenue for us over the next six to seven months. 
Um, we've been on the Melbourne Western Distributor since basically since it can, that started. Um, the biggest project in terms of revenue generation for us over the last 18 months has been the Melbourne Metro Rail project. So this is station boxes, um, tunnelling, a whole range of different things within each of these projects. And the one that's just kicking off is the Brisbane Cross River Rail, where again, we're getting our, just winning our first packages. So um, the, the biggest you know, road and rail infrastructure projects in the country, we're now front and centre in terms of generating revenue. So we're right in the middle of where um, you know, the major development in the country is going on. Um, in terms of the medium and, to, and sort of short to medium term strategy in the business, we've, we've sort of chronically underperformed in New South Wales for some time. We've appointed a new manager in the New South Wales business, who's our ex-Queensland manager, and then also our ex-Victoria ex manager, been with the business 25 odd years. Um, set up a great business in Queensland, moved to Victoria, was primarily responsible for the uplift, uplift we've had in Victoria over the last two or three years. Now moved to Sydney and I expect to see significant benefits come out of his knowledge of the Sydney market. Um, Queensland will go through a, a very strong uplift over the next 12 months, given the infrastructure program that's in place and our exposure to that market, our 60% odd market share. So you're gonna see very good results coming out of our Queensland business. We're gonna to continue to open up new markets with um, product sales. We're gonna to continue to open up our new markets with expanded offering and footprint. So integrating the products uh, as I mentioned, off of Acro Unispan and also the, the Natform business, which is our screens business across all states. So we're already seeing significant new work going on in, in Tasmania, South Australia, Western Australia, um, off the back of the products that we can now offer to those markets. Um, we, our industrial scaffold business that's primarily based in Queensland is now moving into other states. We've got a lot of work now going on in New South Wales. We've actually got work going on right as we speak today at Bayswater Power Station. Um, we'll be doing some work at Liddell. We're doing some work at Mount Piper. Um, and we're also doing some work currently on Olympic Dam in South Australia. So we're growing that part of the business and it's highly profitable. And, um, and you know, something that we think has got, we've got, you know, it's got great benefits to our going forward. And that form, which is our, our screens business, we bought that business, the best ever turnover year was around about $7 million when we bought the business. We're heading towards 10 to $11 million in revenue out of this business this year. Uh, it's a high, and again, high margins. This is like 45 to 50% sort of sales margins um, on, on, this, on this, this part of the business. So, um, you know, we had a relatively slow start when we bought that business, but it's now kicked on at, at, at quite a pace. So, um, you know, we'll do, I said, close, close to $11 million in revenue out of that form. The best ever year we, we, that they'd ever done in the history before was about $7 million. Um, financials and guidance as to where we're headed. So, um, you know, rather than go through a bunch of words, I think these numbers speak for themselves. In the first half of 21, we did $50 million of revenue, which was 32% up for the, that prior corresponding period. You'll see we'll get, we're going to go to $106 million. So we'll be up, we'll do 55 and a half to $56 million of revenue in the second half of 21. So for the full year, we'll be up 22%. EBITDA of 11.1 .1 in the first half. EBITDA for the second half is going to get us to somewhere around 24 million. So probably 12.9 million, $13 million of EBITDA for the second half. So again, we're going to be up around about 23, 24% year on year in EBITDA to the prior, prior year. And our NPAT will probably finish somewhere around nine, which again, will be up around about 15 to 20%, 3.7 in the first half, around 5.3 odd in the second half. So all of the metrics of the business are going in the right direction. Um, and point to a very strong 22. Um, you know, we, we've come out with guidance saying that we, we expect double digit growth in 22. We certainly expect double, digit, we, will, well, we certainly will see double digit growth in 22, a particularly strong start to the financial year off the back of the, the recent contract wins. So, you know, the business is in extremely good shape. And, you know, I should sort of just highlight for people that, you know, haven't sort of followed our story before. If you look at these metrics, this is a business that's current market cap is about $85 million. So for $85 million market cap, you're for a business making $24 million of EBITDA and $9 million of NPAC. That's the current position of ACRO. Um, so, and this is, a, and, and, and every year our earnings improve on the previous year. And this will be again, the case in 22 compared to 21. Um, you know, we're in very good shape. We've got, we're in a part of the industry that's got significant tailwinds, at least for the next decade. Um, we've got, you know, good underlying um, you know, management and, and strength in engineering. We've, we've got sort of, you know, enough, enough strength within our balance sheet to be able to keep, 
pace with the growth that we're going to be seeing over this next period of time. So everything points to a very successful um, period for ACRA. Um, and I'm you know, extremely proud of how we've turned this business around over the last three years from a, a scaffolding of business to now a business that's focusing on the, you know, the real high value added parts of the construction industry. And, and you know, we're now preeminent on you know, the major civil infrastructure projects across all of the country. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Um, actually, I've wanted you to uh, uh, come in ahead of time for somebody who couldn't join us. Um, obviously, you're seeing very strong demand, as you noted, uh, in the presentation. Has that led you to be able to tick up prices a bit um, on, what, on, I guess, work that you're bidding on now? Or how is the pricing environment looking, given you know the, the such strong underlying demand conditions? Yeah, look, I think um, certainly in the civil infrastructure part of the industry, which is where we focus, the prices are very good anyway. There's not a lot of competition. You know, there's, there's, there's probably us and three other major players, and they're all, you know, European subsidiary, or Australian subsidiaries of European companies. So the prices are normally quite stable in that market, but they're strong. Um, we, you know, we get 10 times the return on equipment going out on civil infrastructure projects than you would just around scaffolding. Pricing in, sca look, the scaffolding business is highly commoditized, and I, I don't mean industrial scaffolding, but residential commercial high-rise, it's highly commoditized and really price sensitive. And so prices are not great there, but that's not where we focus. But I think, look, to answer your question, we're happy with the price points. Um, you know, we don't really need to get more, you know, we don't really need to be getting price uplift to get our, our profit uplift. It's coming from further market share and coming from further um, just general growth off the back of the strength of the industry. Okay. And then another one just around um, COVID, has it affected your ability to move gear around the country or um, other kind of supply chain logistics issues, you know, getting stuff out of Spain or, or, or elsewhere if you're, if you're importing it? Look, not, not really. Um, COVID, in fact, COVID had basically no impact at all on our business over the last 15 months, right through the Melbourne lockdown, we continue to operate every day. Um, I mean, we, we haven't basically lost a day's work over this whole period of time. We didn't even go close to needing any assistance from JobKeeper. Um, you know, we did some, we did a range of things sort of this time last year to, to, to keep out, just in case things got a bit pear-shaped in terms of cash, you know, cash security. We renegotiated some arrangements on, le on our property leases, et cetera, et cetera. But um, in terms of getting equipment out of Europe and, and or China, Look, it's it's getting it's getting more expensive. I think anybody that's involved in bringing gear into the country knows that freight rates have gone up significantly. Um, thankfully, the Australian dollar is helping in this regard. But no, we look, we we still. I mean, we, we place an order for gear in Spain. We'll have it here within ten to thirteen weeks. It's still so it's still operating at that sort of level. Okay, great. Um, if we I'll just hold open now in case we've got any questions or further questions from the audience. Uh, Stephen, I'm not sure if you have another slide after this one, but if anybody wants to reach out, or, yeah, that one. So if anybody wants to reach out uh, or get in touch uh, to drop you or Andrew uh, a call. Yep, sure. Um, perfect. Okay, if we don't have any further questions, I think we're pushing up on the time anyway we'll leave it there steve thank you very much for coming back in and, and giving us an update i i, I appreciate the the time and uh, yeah if anybody wants to get in touch with steve or andrew uh, please feel free to reach out thanks for the opportunity mark thank you again cheers thanks steve okay, thanks everybody uh, i'll close it there uh, since we are pushing up on 10 o'clock and the the opening match is going to happen Everybody have a good rest of their Thursday. Thank you.